Good morning. I want to welcome you to worship on this Transfiguration Sunday and a warm greeting to those of you who are worshiping with us online as well. Uh, just a reminder that Wednesday we begin Lent effectively with Ash Wednesday, and we will have two services uh, on Ash Wednesday, a noon service and a 6 p.m. service, both with the imposition of ashes. So uh, hopefully the weather, somebody was telling me that the weather forecast doesn't look really promising, but hopefully the weather holds out and we can gather that day. Um, the only other announcement I want to, is an announcement of joy. Uh, I want to say congratulations to Lauren and Bob Gilmore, who uh, they were expecting, and now uh, they have been excited to have the delivery of Walter Dean Gilmore, uh, eight, eight, uh, let's see, eight pounds, 14 ounces, 22 inches is the statistics that Rod gave me. Congratulations to Rod and Cindy, who are also proud grandparents. Uh, just saw a picture of him, and he, he looks just like Bob. So uh, congratulations to, to Lauren and Bob um, on this joyous occasion. Those are all of our announcements. As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, let us stand as you are able as we begin with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. Remember that you are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Jesus Christ, light of life. transfiguration of your Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the witness of Moses and Elijah, and in the voice from the bright cloud declaring, Jesus, your beloved Son, you foreshadowed our adoption as your children. Make us heirs with Christ of your glory, and bring us to enjoy its fullness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning. We're going to have a few mountaintop experiences today in our readings. So. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 24. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again. For... Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. Let's read Psalm 2 responsibly. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why do the peoples mutter empty threats? Why do the kings of the earth rise up and revolt? 
and the princes plot together against the Lord and against the Lord's anointed. Let us break their yoke, they say. Let us cast off their bounds from us, bonds from us. Holds them to derision. Then in wrath, God speaks to them, and in rage, fills them with terror. King of Bonsai and my holy mountain. Let me announce the decree of the Lord who said to me, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall crush them with an iron rod and shatter them like a piece of pottery. And now, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Submit to the Lord with fear and with trembling, trembling, bow in worship. Test the Lord, be angry, and you perish in a sudden blaze of wrath. Happy are all who take refuge in God. The second reading is from 2 Peter chapter 1. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of their majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do, do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The word of the Lord. Please rise. We lift our hands in prayer like incense rising Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 17th chapter. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, once, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
congregation may be seated, I'd like to invite our children for it, for our children's message. How are you guys? I am so excited that you're here. I get to do a children's sermon. What makes you, what gives you guys excitement? Anything you guys get excited for? Birthdays. You have a big party? Yeah, you get lots of presents. Christmas. Christmas. That's exciting. That's a, that's a fun time with family. Easter. Easter. That's another exciting time, isn't it? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. You're just rattling them off, aren't you? Did you get lots of candy this year? Awesome. Thanksgiving. Lots of what? What are you excited for on Thanksgiving? Um, turkey. Turkey, yeah. Yeah, I was excited. You know what I get excited about? Well, I got excited last Sunday. You know what last Sunday was? It was the Super Bowl. You know who won the Super Bowl, don't you? The Chiefs. So that was really exciting, right? I wish that the party could keep going. The excitement could keep going. And we have a story. Sometimes we get so excited that we want to just continue in the excitement. We have a story today. I want to read this story to you. What? Yeah, let me read this story to you about a time when the disciples of Jesus were super excited and wanted it to continue. Peter, James, and John were very excited. They were climbing a mountain with Jesus. Higher and higher they climbed right to the top. Then they noticed something different about Jesus. Jesus' face and clothes were bright and shiny like the sun. Moses and the prophet Elijah were standing with Jesus talking about God's promise to save the world. Peter couldn't believe his eyes. Look at these guys. It's so bright they can hardly see. And suddenly a cloud covered the mountain and a voice said, This is my son. Listen to him. The voice was God. And Peter, James, and John covered their faces. And then Jesus touched them. And they peeked up, and everything was the same as it was before, even Jesus. On the way back down the mountain, Jesus, Peter, James, and John talked about God's promise, but they didn't tell anyone else what had happened on the mountain for a long time. So there you go. There's how bright it was, and there they are covering their eyes right there. And it was an exciting, exciting, exciting time. Is there an alligator? Did you see it? Did you see him? Alligator? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure the alligator was excited too. It was an exciting, exciting time. And they wanted to do what? They wanted to stay up on the mountain, but Jesus led them back down. And you know why he led them back down? Because there was something even more exciting down below, and they were about to experience Jesus' love for them down below. So that's what is so exciting. I want you guys to remember how excited you are on those special occasions and know how excited Jesus is to love each one of you. How about that? That Jesus is excited for each one of you. Can you say hi to him? Did they wave back? All right. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for exciting times in our lives and for the excitement of our Lord with these children. And Lord, remind us that you are excited for them, that you're excited for each one of us as your children. Help your light to shine brightly in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up today. Well, before I came in here, Donna Walter said, you better watch the forecast for Wednesday. And I kind of chuckled because, to be honest with you, I've kind of just about had it with our winter weather forecasts. No, seriously. They say one thing, and I'm going to go on a rant here for a little bit. They say one thing and then change their minds based on the latest model that comes out. And then there's always the European model, which seems to be more accurate anyway. And I'm thinking, what? How, are they, how do they know more than we do? 
And first, last week, we expected a lot of snow, and then they changed the forecast, and then I was looking at it, and I'm like, nothing's going to happen. We're going to be fine. We live in northwest Omaha, no snow whatsoever. I went to bed thinking, don't have to worry about getting the shovel or the snowblower out, and then lo and behold, what? I wasn't expecting to see that much snow on the ground. That's the funny thing, I think, about human expectation, that sometimes, sometimes we create expectations based on what we think might be in our best interest or what we hope might happen. And at other times, I think we create expectations in order to really mitigate, if you will, some level of disappointment that might ensue in our lives. Or in the words of Maya Angelou, hoping for the best, prepared for the worst, and unsurprised by anything in between. But maybe it's best to abide by the wisdom that said, Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. And yet I think it's naive to say that you and I don't live out our daily lives, at least without some degree, some semblance of expectation. This was most certainly true of Peter and James and John on the mountaintop with, with Jesus. We can't imagine what they were expecting as Jesus made them trudge and hike up to the top of the mountain. Perhaps they were expecting to have a nice scenic view, a nice place in which to reflect and to pray from. Certainly they weren't expecting the brilliant lights, the radiant garments, the likes of Moses and Elijah and a voice, a dramatic voice, no doubt, from the cloud. And for Peter, this falls, of course, into the camp of pleasant surprise. For Peter urgently turns to Jesus and responds, Lord, it is good for us to be here as he soaks it in. And then he suggests that he builds three tents or three dwellings so that they might settle in for a while to extend the excitement. Poor Peter. What else was he supposed to do? That in the face of the divine, in the face of the wondrous light of God, in the wonder of such a mystical and mysterious experience, Peter couldn't think beyond himself. He couldn't think beyond his own narrow worldview. In all honesty, in the face of the divine, Peter's reaction really is as human as I think it gets. You see, Jesus was born to usher in something new, the kingdom of God and all of its wonder and glory. Jesus came as the Word made flesh to redeem the world from sin. That's a big deal. But all poor Peter could think about in that moment were, his, were the earthly possibilities. Possibilities based upon the limits of his own expectations, his own thinking. In Peter's understanding of the world, things didn't last forever, so why not build these three dwellings and extend the experience a little longer based on his own human control? Before we go bashing the disciple Peter too much for his limited, narrow point of view, perhaps we should ask ourselves what we would do if you and I found ourselves in the same kind of alpine predicament. Wouldn't you and I want to experience the same thing, to extend our experience, our time up on that mountain? I mean, I'm still kind of happy that the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, but alas, what? Life must go on. This is how we as humans operate, isn't it? We're limited by our own human expectations. We're limited by our own frail imagination when we stand before the glorious power of what God makes new and makes possible in our lives. There was an interesting cartoon once of a fourth grade boy. He was standing toe to toe, nose to nose with his teacher and behind them was a board with an overwhelming amount of math problems that the boy had yet to finish. And so with a rare adult perception, the boy says, I'm not an underachiever, you're an overexpector. 
over expector. I kind of like that. Except this isn't the predicament Peter nor you and I find ourselves as we gather this morning by the Holy Spirit. After all, I think it's not that we expect too much of God. It's that surely we don't expect enough. That we don't dream as big. Sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, we're afraid to think too big or to imagine too grandly what the Holy Spirit might have in store. That's why in all honesty, in my personal prayers are really quite often a simple ask to not miss out on what God wants me to see happening around the world in my midst. And in my prayers, I ask that God would help me to slow down a bit to discern what God is doing around me. And if I need to be, to wake me up from slumber with a bright light or a voice that says, get up, do not be afraid. And yet how many times in our life of prayer do we ask God for something that is quite too small? something that fits only with the framework of our own human expectation. And how often does God answer our prayers by surprising us perhaps with something else, something we hadn't thought of, something beyond our mortal thinking. So often it's God who has different but more glorious ideas in mind for our lives and our world. Indeed, Luther, Martin Luther was correct in his explanation of God's kingdom and the Lord's prayer. He says God's kingdom comes on its own without our prayer, but we ask in this prayer that it may also come to us in other words that we might see it and understand what God is doing in our midst. Sometimes we as God's people just need a little help, a little assistance in recognizing God's kingdom. We need help in imagining, perhaps, the possibilities of the living Christ in our midst. And is this not what happened to Peter and the disciples as they discovered God doing something new with the transfiguration of His Son on that mountain? That it wasn't just Jesus in all His transfigured, bright glory on a mountain that Peter was asked to see, but rather there was a purpose beyond that mountaintop experience. For Peter and James and John, they were called to experience what happened below that mountaintop, to experience the glory of what Jesus was about to accomplish on the cross in Jerusalem. And maybe this is, after all, why the story concludes so nicely with a mysterious voice that speaks from the cloud and says, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased in the command, listen to him. Listen to him. And now as we gather here, it's you and I as God's beloved who are asked finally to suspend all of our worldly expectations with its limits to listen finally to what Jesus is saying in our lives. For Jesus, I think, speaks to us at the intersection of our broken world and God's redemptive new creation. There Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you, that we might taste the abundant and redemptive power of his love. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing, reminding us that not one of us is ever beyond his freely given grace. Jesus speaks the word, Today you will be with me in paradise reminding us, each of us, of the immediacy of God's kingdom that's here for each one of us. And then Jesus finally says, get up and be not afraid. 
using the very same words he uses when he raises the dead, reminding you and I that God does not simply abandon us in this life or in death, that we are promised to be with him forever. Jesus is speaking to you and I right now this very day. But what is he saying? And whatever it is, I pray as we enter the season of Lent next week that you can slow down just enough in this noisy and this messy, broken world to finally hear his transforming voice for your life. To experience both his revealed and his mysterious presence, transfigured, crucified, and risen, telling you that you are my child. You are the beloved with whom I am well pleased. What else would you expect? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the story today that you open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to your glory, that you help us imagine and dream beyond human expectations and limits. Help us to slow down in these days ahead, to experience your majesty and especially your voice that speaks to us. Help us to imagine and hear the ways in which you are doing new things in our lives. Help to be with us as a congregation as you help to see the new things that you are doing in our midst and in our mission together. We ask your blessings upon us as we prepare to enter into a season of Lent, a season in which we are called to slow down, to be quiet, and to hear your voice and the great big things that you're doing for our world. In your name we pray. Amen.
Let us join together in confessing our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Call together to follow Jesus. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Lord, embolden your church as its witnesses to the majesty and mercy of your Son. Equip lay preachers, deacons, and pastors. Move us to share our stories of your faithfulness and forgiveness. And may our lives proclaim your greatness. Merciful God, Dwell with your whole creation from the tallest mountain to the deepest valley. Bless the work of conservation organizations to protect vital habitats. Support the work of disaster relief agencies around the world. We continue to lift up areas that are affected by earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Merciful God, receive receive our our prayer. prayer. Guide and give wisdom to all in authority for local leaders, our governor, for state legislators, for our president and national legislators. Bring freedom and justice to all nations. Merciful God, receive receive our our prayer. prayer. Lord, give shelter to those who lack safe homes. Spur communities to work for fair housing. Protect our neighbors whose dwellings do not keep out dangerous cold or heat. Accompany with your touch those who are homebound, sick, or isolated, or suffering in body, mind, or spirit. We lift up to you this morning Dolores and Glenda. We pray for Donna and Don, for Kim, for Rick, for Virgine and Emily, for Kent, for Don, and for John. And Lord, we lift up to you the loved ones who we hold in our own hearts. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. Make us eager to receive your word and scripture. Help us to recognize Jesus' voice in the needs of our neighbors. Make us confident to follow the way of the cross. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive our thanksgiving for the holy ones who have guided us in faithfulness and have gathered even the unlikely as your people. With our forebears in faith and all who have hoped in you, Teach us to wait with courage until the promised day dawns. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you, Lord, our needs and our hopes, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you as you're comfortable to turn and to share a sign of that peace with one another. We continue our worship by sharing our gifts and our offerings.
us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive now these offerings and thanksgiving for all of your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who sharing our life lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to your own brilliant light, And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's table has been prepared, and all are invited. Be seated, please.
congregation to please stand as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and journey humbly with you. Amen. And now the God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod will strengthen and uphold you this day and forevermore. Amen. with Christ into a weary world to share the good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.